fantastic. <laughs> Excellent. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll donate yeah. my extra five to Stephen. Okay. <laughs> and then we've got a, a surprise visitor. Uh, actually, you've been donating it to uh, I saw I, I talked to him as I was coming yeah. in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I won't mention it now, but um, at 10.30 we'll have a surprise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know, I know. But that's perfect that you have a like, uh, few minutes at the end. Thank you very much for donating them. <laughs> Is this working? Oh, yes. Good morning, everybody. We're working. <laughs> yes, good morning, everybody. What a fabulous day we had yesterday. And uh, the weather is great also for our trips out in our afternoons. So I hope you enjoyed yesterday, and uh, I certainly did. Uh, and this morning we've got a great program. Um, we have four speakers this morning, and uh, one this afternoon, and then we're going to visit... Uh, down Cathedral in the afternoon. Before I forget, also we're going to fit in um, something at uh, lunchtime for you. If you finished your lunch by 1.40, uh, you could come back into the auditorium and you can see the uh, St. Patrick film. So it's a brand new film about St. Patrick and the centre uh, uh, and uh, the archaeology and history of, of St. Patrick and St. Patrick's Day. And this is a great film that actually covers all five of the screens, so it's sort of like a, an immersive experience, you might say. So uh, that's about 12 minutes. So if you want to come in at, 11, uh, at 1 1.40, uh, you could experience that before our afternoon talk uh, when David will be telling us about Picty Stones at 2 o'clock. Okay, so uh, this morning, uh, it's great to be able to introduce Michael Carroll uh, from Chicago. And he did a BA in Fine Art at Loyola University of Chicago and was greatly influenced by George Bain. Uh, he became a freelance calligrapher and really was uh, uh, completely absorbed by the Book of Kells and really for many years studied it very carefully uh, and started producing his own original Celtic art, introducing modern themes and motifs. Uh, and he's taken a particular interest in key patterns and knot work. And as I, I, at the last conference, I was lucky enough to take part in one of his workshops in key patterns. And it was just a great experience. And he's doing that again on uh, Saturday afternoon. So uh, that'll be up in the education area where you have your lunch. Okay, Saturday afternoon after uh, Cynthia's talk. So... Um, He's going to show us how he dis distilled the methods of, uh, of uh, key pattern, and he's going to tell us about his methods to today. So he's going to prepare us uh, for his, his uh, workshop, if you'd like to take part in that. And he's, he's, he's distilling the methods into their pure essence, which is, uh, I thought, a lovely way of saying it. So welcome, Michael. Great, great to have you, and I'll pass on now to, to yourself. There we are. We are on. <laughs> Good morning, um, and thank you all so much for coming. Uh, I'm very happy to be here today at the, uh, the second IDCA conference. Um, I'd like to thank our host, Mike King, and everyone here at the St. Patrick Center uh, for planning and organizing all the events. Uh, I'd also, in addition, uh, like to thank all of uh, my friends and uh, really uh, a family uh, that we have here of uh, like-minded individuals who have come together. And uh, it's, uh, it's, I've, I've really felt welcomed and it does really feel like a family. So thank you very well, all very much. At, uh, to uh, clarify, uh, today I, I'll 
At this conference, or th this talk, I'll be discussing uh, key patterns and in my workshop. Um, today, I, I, I'm going to be talking more of, about the, the historical development of the key patterns, and I'll go into my methods in, on the Saturday at the, the workshop. Um, and key patterns really have been always been the least understood of all the Celtic art forms. Um, I struggled for years uh, pasting bits and pieces together and trying to reproduce the historical examples. Uh, but I had re no real understanding of the structural elements and, and no idea how to use them in a creative way. Uh, and so finally, out of frustration in, in 2015, um, I decided to take a hard look at those key patterns I'd been avoiding and, uh, and do some serious research. And my investigation into their structure um, naturally led to uh, a search for their historical roots and the evidence of their development, uh, which I'd like to discuss today. I began uh, by analyzing the basic structure of uh, both maze and, and key patterns in search of their common roots, uh, hoping to find the holy grail, the one true historical method. Uh, and I found the common roots, but as for the grail, uh, well, it seems there never really was one, uh, or never really was just one. And looking through the historical record, uh, it's obvious that the methods of choice depended on a number of factors, uh, including personal preference. Um, some artists used grids to lay out their patterns. Uh, others preferred to work freehand. Some very carefully planned their designs, uh, while others like to improvise, just, just as artists still do today. In uh, recent years, I've had the pleasure to uh, correspond with our colleague, Dr. Cynthia Thickpenny, uh, on the subject of key patterns uh, and improvisation. Um, our separate lines of research uh, began about the same time. Um, and fortunately, since then, we've been able to compare notes, uh, a really wonderful uh, exchange of thoughts and ideas. And from what I've seen in the manuscripts, uh, it confirms our observations on the, uh, the variety of methods used. And I particularly like her comparison of the insular artist to jazz artists. Um, they constantly push the boundaries of the art form while respecting its structure. And that's a good metaphor because uh, in jazz, the song is the structure. It, it's, a, it's a framework for the artist to improvise on. And once you've learned the basic rules, uh, you don't have to think about the music, you just play. And drawing key patterns is much the same. Um, they require the ability to improvise and to think on different levels. Uh, and they come with a set of rules that must be respected. Um, they can be done using a variety of methods and strategies, uh, depending on the complexity and scale of the design. But because the guidelines eventually become part of the pattern, um, it's extremely difficult to tell how it was constructed after the fact. Um, there's still no con academic consensus on exactly which methods were used, uh, and even the basic structure of key pattern is only now beginning to be understood. Uh, mostly this is because uh, historians have never agreed on a set of terms to define what they were looking at. And uh, so, so I prefer to use the ones that, that seem the most precise. In her uh, recent thesis, Dr. Thickpenny uh, present, proposed a new set of terms to describe the structure of key pattern, uh, expanding on those of J. Romilly Allen. Uh, no doubt her terminology will, will become the academic standard, and so I've adopted it and, uh, and also expanded on it. Now, based on their structure, um, I would designate mazes apart from key patterns. But based on their chronology in insular art, uh, I believe we also need to include a subcategory for the latter. J. Romilly Allen um, grouped mazes and key patterns together um, under the name key pattern, and most scholars still do. A uh, hundred years later, uh, Aidan Meehan also grouped them together, but called them maze patterns. And I think we should use both terms because there is a clear structural difference. Uh, mazes are most commonly done in square or diamond-shaped cells, as seen here in the Book of Duro. But the host cell can be of any shape. What really matters is the course of the path within the cell. In a maze, uh, the paths always remain parallel to each other uh, as they approach the center. Uh, there's no neg negative background other than the outlines of the path. 
In key pattern, uh, the path diverges at an angle, uh, leaving areas of background visible, usually little black triangles or rectangles. And like mazes, uh, key patterns are spirals and straight lines, but the course of the path is much different and much more variable. The ones uh, we most often think of as key patterns uh, are a special case, and uh, as such, de deserve their own subcategory. Uh, I'll be referring to these as triangular key patterns or triangular keys. Though they, uh, they sometimes appear in single rows, they're, they're usually drawn in pairs uh, by dividing the diamond-shaped cell uh, into two triangular half cells. And the dividing bars, which you see in white here, uh, give them the appearance of being stacked in rows, but they're actually far more easily constructed by splitting the diamond cells rather than pasting together triangular ones. And finally, uh, mazes and keys can be combined in the same panel. Uh, combination patterns are an advanced motif and the final stage of development. Uh, as usual, uh, J. Romilly Allen was the first to notice this development, uh, although from what I've seen in the manuscripts, his conclusions seem to have been a bit premature. But never, uh, never underestimate R J. Romilly Allen or write him off as out of date. Uh, he may not always be right, but he's never far from the truth. Uh, he and Joseph Anderson recorded an astounding number of ancient patterns along with their locations. But uh, unfortunately, they never organized them chronologically. And I'm sorry to report that after years of searching, I, I've been unable to find any study that examines maze and key patterns in the order they appear <coughs> in insular art. Uh, luckily, in the past decade, we've seen a huge increase in uh, online facsimiles. And so in my research, I've been able to go through the original manuscripts page by page, uh, charting the appearance of each type. In uh, early Christian monuments, Romilly Allen suggested that key patterns were the inevitable result of turning a square grid into a diagonal one. Um, he believed that they were developed in order to fill the empty triangles along the edges of a diagonal maze. Uh, a logical conclusion and what I expected to find in the manuscripts. But uh, instead, it's, it appears that uh, the chronology of development was not so neat, and, uh, and with a slight twist on Romilly Allen's theory. Now, without question, uh, chevrons and mazes were the first on the scene. These appear already fully developed on the Maze-In bracelet, uh, carved over 20,000 years ago, mammoth ivory, no less. Uh, now, Aidan Meaden claims that this carving represents the uh, historical sequence of development uh, from chevron to maze, uh, which is intriguing, but uh, of course the original artist's intention can't be proven. But, uh, it, but it is amazing to see such advanced work being done in the Paleolithic. Uh, this artist was no novice, but a master carver uh, with an intuitive understanding of the geometric principles. It's a long jump from maize in Ukraine to the British Isles, uh, both in distance and time. Um, we don't know exactly how or when mazes first arrived, although carvings of, of, she of chevrons and diamond patterns uh, in early, uh, early uh, insular art, such as at Newgrange, uh, may indicate an early date. But we can't discount the uh, influence of the Romans, and through them, the influence of Greek art. Um, here we see Samuel Lyson's uh, 18th century reconstruction of the great Orpheus mosaic at Winchester. Uh, Greco-Roman mazes and uh, fretwork would certainly have been familiar to uh, artists south of, of Hadrian's Wall and to some extent Scotland. Uh, notably though, uh, classic, classical mazes are done on the square, not on, not on the diagonal, uh, which is the norm in insular art. Um, however, a diagonal five-dot grid is used in Roman plate work, uh, the predecessor and basis for knot work. So it is possible that the insular artists oriented their mazes diagonally in order to take advantage of the same grid. Um, unfortunately, this most likely will remain a theory since the very little evidence survives from the time between the Roman period and the first appearance of diagonal mazes. <coughs> There must have been uh, some stages of development, but we have no idea <laughs> what that might have looked like. 
Um, diagonal mazes burst onto the scene fully formed in the Book of Duro, usually dated from the mid-7th century. And here we can see that the artists have already mastered large field designs and uh, are experimenting with uh, their form, including some that come remarkably close to key pattern. But notably, the borders remain empty, uh, there, and there is not a single scrap of triangular key, key pattern to be found. The Durham Gospels uh, also contain uh, complex maze patterns, uh, even adapted for circles. And all the major Celtic motifs are there, but once again, with the exception of triangular key patterns. Uh, Folio 2R uh, does have a semi-circular semi key pattern seen here on the right, uh, a premonition of things to come. But the, but the artist still had a problem. Uh, filling, fitting a di diagonal maze into a rectangular panel leaves empty triangles along the edges, and so far they still hadn't figured out a way to fill them. At the beginning um, of the 8th century, we see the first triangular keys in the uh, Lindisfarne and St. Chad Gospels, fully formed in uh, horizontal and vertical rows. And once again, there are no precedents in insular art and no earlier stages of development. And I think the most striking thing about these early manuscripts is that the mazes and triangular keys will appear on the same page, but never in the same panel. And obviously, the artists consider them to be different motifs, not to be mixed. Uh, and this is surprising. Uh, with their common structure, you, you would expect, as, as Romilly Allen did, that the key patterns evolved directly from the maze, not separately. But uh, Cynthia Thickpenny's research has shown that, that key patterns likely began with the running dog pattern in weaving, uh, a hook shape that provides uh, strength and cohesion and prevents the fabric from warping. Although uh, structurally related to mazes, it seems the key patterns developed independently and that triangular keys deserve their own category. Their late appearance in the, ma in the manuscripts and their de deliberate separation from mazes, I believe, is strong evidence to support this. But once, uh, once introduced, uh, these new patterns seem to have made quite an impact. Um, by mid-century, they turn up in the uh, St. Gall Gospels, numbers 60 and 1395, as well as the Akensis and Cadmid Gospels. And uh, here, triangular key patterns are the dominant uh, motif, knocking mazes out of fashion. But again, wherever they do appear, uh, mazes and key patterns are always drawn in separate panels. Until the Book of Dima. Uh, being a pocket gospel, Dima is, is often overlooked in favor of the larger, more decorated manuscripts. But in this little book, uh, we see that the scribes had finally solved their century-old problem, how to fill those empty triangles along the borders of the maze. It was, it was almost inevitable, uh, since mazes and keys share the same structure, one has to wonder what took them so long. But, um, but once the two were combined, the artist instantly recognized the, the possibilities. In the Book of Dima and the, uh, the later St. Gall Gospels, we see the first wave of experimentation. Uh, you really have to love the artist of St. Gall 51. Without question, it's the most creative work ever done by a bad draftsman. Um, he's a bit sloppy, he works too fast, and he makes a few mistakes but his ideas are absolutely brilliant. Uh, it's practically an entire library of new maze and key patterns. Um, some reduced to near abstraction, others embellished with spirals and lozenges. And so by the end of the eighth century, uh, the maze was back with a vengeance and fortified with triangular keys. Uh, in the Book of Kells, we find the same wonderful library of motifs as St. Gall, but, uh, but done in an expert hand with sophistication, style, and subtlety. Uh, and here we see two examples done by, uh, designed by the artist formerly known as the portrait painter, but uh, now identified by Donka McGavin as the scribe artist. <coughs> While not uh, as finely executed as Kells, the, uh, the Harley Golden Gospels also, also contain many examples of both triangular keys and combination patterns. Uh, this detail here is a good example of how mazes and keys can be mitered in borders. And over the next uh, two centuries, maize and key patterns would become uh, fine art, um, especially in the later Pictish stones and the Irish high crosses. Uh, just as in Kells, we see an amazing variety of uh, 
combinations along with transitions to other motifs such as knot work spirals and zoomorphics. Um, and the sculptured stones that contain key pattern are uh, pretty much all considered to be class two or three uh, contemporary with or later than the Book of Kells. And these represent the last stage of development. So for a quick recap, uh, mazes arrive sometime around 600 to 650 AD in Durham and Duro, um, along with early key patterns. Not long after, in the Lindisfarne Gospels, we see the first triangular keys, which become wildly popular and spread very quickly. And finally, at the turn of the ninth century, uh, artists first recognized the common structure of maze and key patterns and combined them, uh, just in time for the, the last and greatest blossoming of insular art. Now, the development of insular key pattern took place over a period of roughly 400 years. Um, and archaeologically speaking, this is a very, very short span, and dating is problematic, uh, especially given the small number of surviving artworks. But, uh, but I feel the manuscripts will always be our best source, uh, since they can be more reliably dated than metal or stonework. And the manuscript record seems to suggest that we can trace the development of maze and key patterns by correlating their structure and their chronology. Um, it's possible that future discoveries will upset this timeline, and I'd welcome anything that gets us closer to the truth. Um, that's the scientific method. But, uh, but for now, we, we must work with what we have, and uh, I think the manuscripts are still our best bet. My own uh, research into key pattern has mainly been a structural analysis, uh, but that analysis naturally led me to investigate its historical roots. Um, Dr. Thickpenny's research in that area has been very enlightening, and uh, our conversations have both widened my scope and challenged my preconceptions of key pattern itself. In my, uh, in my Saturday workshop, I'll be discussing the, um, the structural elements and uh, demonstrating a new approach, which I call the, the diamond method. And it's uh, not so much a new method as a, a, a new way of thinking. It's a, it's a systematic way for artists to create new key pattern. Um, and a precise tool for scholars to uh, analyze and reverse engineer the ancient ones. <coughs> so I hope you'll uh, join us on Saturday for a hands-on experience in, uh, in drawing these endlessly fascinating patterns. And uh, again, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you all so much for listening, and I hope to, s and I hope to see you then. I will. <laughs> I will take, uh, I'll, in order to save time and give a few minutes to our next speakers, I'll, I'll take uh, questions when we come back in a little while. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for that great history of a fascinating uh, pattern. And uh, now um, we have a, a surprise uh, event. And Hamish uh, visited Courtney Davis on the way up here. And, uh, and persuaded him um, to come and visit us, which is fantastic. So I'm going to pass on to Hamish to uh, introduce. So I was. Uh, <coughs> I grew up in uh, from a Scottish family. I grew up in Kent and Cornwall, and um, there's a fabulous bookshop uh, around about at the top of the hill where Tintagel Castle is, and uh, I first picked up a. Uh, a little volume of George Bain's books, if you remember the little box set with six little uh, pieces in there. And then the amazing, colourful books of Courtney Davis, Jim Fitzpatrick, and uh, the structural stuff of Aidan Meehan. And those three gentlemen became my main influences. And I uh, haven't seen Courtney for a couple of years because of various reasons, no travelling in COVID, but I'm uh, um, very happy to introduce Courtney Davis, uh, a legend of Celtic art, I'm going to say that. Many artists and craftspeople that um, um, 
maybe started from my books and from Aidan's and um, Jim Fitzpatrick. So it's um, it's a great honour to um, to be here and. Um, you know, I'm one of these people, I'm, I'm like a, a lot of um, Celtic artists, um, we, we kind of hide, our, hide away and um, I mean I did 53 books over the years and so um, although I was married um, four, four times and my wife suddenly realised very soon, you know, that they might be married to this famous Celtic artist but um, you know, most of the time he's in the uh, studio and painting from not 8 o'clock in the morning till maybe 9, 10 o'clock at night. So, um, yeah. Um, I started in the uh, 90s. I don't know how many of you um, know my story, but I started in 1977 and um, doing some kind of rough kind of um, ideas. Um, they were mainly kind of like William Blake-ish kind of pictures. And um, I needed to um, have a kind of border um, around some of them. And my, my um, third wife at the time, she, uh, she hated the William Blake stuff, but she quite liked all the patterns. And so gradually um, the patterns took over and William Blake went out the window. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and one, um, in 1977, um, I... Um, I had a, my first spine operation, and um, it was from after um, that um, operation, while I was in, lying in the, in the hospital, um, I had this huge experience where um, um, I was, um, I had eight, what I, what I th thought were um, monks, but were actually um, eight aspects of Merlin, and um, they took over my body and so they took me through a two-hour operation while I was lying on the bed, taking me out of my, my physical body and then cutting pieces out of my body, putting it back together and, and then putting me back together. And um, from that experience, um, I decided to um, de de dedicate, my <coughs> dedicate my life to, um, to spirit. And, um, and it took me about two, three years of um, searching. Uh, being, um, I was a Buddhist monk, uh, all kinds of different uh, religions, but none of them really um, kind of um, hit the spot of um, what, I, what I could actually feel inside. And it was when my, my dad died that um, I had to look after my mum. And so the, um, the drawings really took over and I, I spent lots more time drawing them and um, I, I, let, I found the Georgia Bain book and, um, and, and, uh, and started working on, on him. Um, one of the things I've got to explain is that I had a, um, a, a, um, a stroke um, this time last year and so my speech sometimes um, does kind of um, stop. Um, so anyway, so um, I started working on the jo jo George Bain book and I created um, some little um, things uh, over the years, some little paperback, little books of my own. And then um, I, I met up with this guy called um, uh, Peter Quiller who, um, was con in con who was in connection with Merlin and um, he asked me if I would um, do a picture of Merlin and he, what he would say was to go out at night and look up at the plough in the sky and ask Merlin for help. And so I went out with this one night and a shooting star went through the plough and when I went back to the drawing board, um, um, little blue lights started moving over the, over the drawings and gradually over the years these little blue what well, actually it was it was actually about two years um, they were like teaching me um, what to do and what not to do like if I was trying to put in um, a bit of design that I I thought was quite neat and would fit in really well then the, then the lights would stop but then when um, I uh, took that design out, then the lights would start again. And so the, over the years, they, they kept teaching me to, um, 
to just to go with the the spirit go go with the with the energy rather than um um courtney and and so and in the, so when i was doing a lot of the pictures um i would actually have a television going watching movies and i would be doing um the celtic art and, and i was doing like three or four pages sometimes of a book a day because I I would add like three books a year that I would be doing and, and a lot of those were like 100, 128 pages of, um, of pictures and so I was doing like three four pages a day <laughs> any, any questions <laughs> and so um, um, and this kind of grew over over the years. I mean, the the thing with um, um, I don't know about any other artists, but um, um, as a as an artist, you always get stung by publishers, by um, people who are supposed to be there to protect you. And, stuff. and so I lost my business three times um, over the years. Um, but um, I just kept on kept on going because it was like. Um, the money wasn't the, um, the, 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 the drive, it was like the, the spirit inside me. And um, yeah, um, I don't know. Um, what are you going to do? And uh, most artists are kind of horrible at this, but um, promoting their own stuff. But Courtney has a fabulous studio. Um, there's a little row of shops at the Hilatara, and uh, his is the end studio in the in the row of shops at Hilatara. So, uh, anybody got any questions? Stick your hand up, and I'll bring the mic to you. <coughs> Yeah, Courtney, I guess when we, what you're speaking about, having the spirit come through you, I know it's hard to see when you're on stage, but this, I'm Steve O'Loughlin, I met you just, a, that's, that's it, we're all in that. And uh, just the visualization and the mystical experience of a personification of your own spiritual energy into uh, Merlin, and it, that's just a fascinating chapter in translating your own and getting past yourself your own personality yeah into uh into that creative spirit and is there any more elaboration you can do on that yeah um well i mean i have to say um um i i've worked with that energy really since 1977 and um and actually it was in um um 2000 and um What's, what's 10 years ago, <laughs> 12, 13, um, the, that energy stopped for a year, right, and, um, and, I, and I couldn't paint, I couldn't do anything, and, um, and then um, my mother died, and it gave me the opportunity to, um, to come to Ireland, and um, I came, I, I came, went to, to live in Cork, Oh, water everywhere. Bless you. <laughs> so I, I came to uh, uh, to live in Cork, and um, which was great. I mean, um, um, uh, and it there was a, a certain tree that I used to go to, a fairy tree that I used to go to, and this one time um, I went there, and it was felt like um, the. Um, I called it the angel of, of um, Ireland wrapped itself around me. And um, and so um, a couple of days later, a friend of mine said, um, why don't you come to the Hilatara? I'm going to the Hilatara. He was, he was selling um, puzzles and stuff. 
And, um, and so um, I went to the Hilatara, and it was really all my, all my life. And what happens is that when I've finished painting the picture and stuff like that, um, it, it's like um, somebody wipes the blackboard clear. And so if anybody asked me of anything about the, um, what I was doing, um, I am, it's, it's gone. And so um, I, I came to Tara, and I had absolutely no idea what Tara was. Okay? And I was penniless. I, 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 I just finished another disaster. And, um, and that was one of the reasons with our, going to Ireland, I thought maybe I just need to change the energy. And so I went for a cup of coffee right, into the, in the coffee shop, and the guy recognised me and said, um, I've got an empty barn down the road. Would you like to do an exhibition for two months? And, um, and so I went there, and um, I just had a, some pictures hung up on, on, on a... You can imagine what an empty barn was like. And um, within two weeks, I'd sold a painting for 6,000 euro. And it, so it gave me enough money to create the, a gallery that I, you know, I, that I, was, that I, I wanted. And, um, and I've been there for 10 years. So I was there, supposed to be there for two months. And I've been there for 10 years. <laughs> and it's kind of grown from um, me just painting to um, it's now a centre where we have all kinds of people come in to um, do events and stuff like that. So it's... Kind of, it's um, my, my life, especially this last 10 years, is, is all about kind of giving back. And so I'm kind of, um, you know, the, the more I'm kind of stepping away from, you know, as an artist, you're always blinking, looking f for the next advance or something to keep you going for the next month. And um, but it's kind of like um, um, the, the energies now, of, especially since that the angel, this angel wrapped itself around me. It really felt like um, um, it's really, you know, where I've been work, I've been working with these energies for all this time. But this was right. It was like um, now is the time that, that you're going to be looked after. And um, yeah, and actually, you know, just like being here now with all you people, you know. Um, and that's that's a real real blessing for me that so uh, you're here, and um, you're kind of continuing on um, the, the that kind of tradition, you know. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Courtney, for coming to visit us. And you're tell welcome. Us story, it's fantastic. Yeah. Great surprise to. Uh, everyone, and uh, we wish you well in your future. And, uh, Thank you. Definitely, def I'm definitely going to come and visit you when I'm next in Tara. I'm there Thank you. in July, so I'll drop in. Actually, all right, there you go. I've got 25 people with me, so I'll bring them all. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got a nice room upstairs. Oh, really? So, Fantastic. Yeah. I might inc incorporate this into my tour. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you very and much. great coffee. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, all it. right, so thank you very, yeah. very much. All of you, your help. Thank you. I, I hope you might uh, be able to um, stay with us. In the, in, we're going to come into the gallery about 20 past uh, 11. If you're still here, we'd love to have yeah. a chat. Okay? Oh, cool. sorry. I'm, I'm still alive. <laughs> okay. Cool. <laughs> Thank you very much, Courtney. Hope to see you shortly. <laughs> okay, we'll be in the gallery at uh, twenty past eleven. So, okay. What a fantastic surprise that was, and. Uh, these things happen when you arrange your conferences. Sometimes it's just magic. There's quite a few things happening today, actually, <laughs> that weren't scheduled, but they're going to be uh, they're going to be brilliant. So, a few more surprises later on. Okay. Um,
And now it's my pleasure to invite um, Ruth Black to uh, speak to us. I met Ruth in the, at the first conference of 2019, and that was, that was great fun, and we really enjoyed hearing about her work. And um, it's great that she's coming back to talk to, to all of you as well um, this year. She's a textile artist working in the highlands of Scotland, uh, around Inverness, and was a, a school science technician before then becoming a full-time artist around about 20 years ago. Um, and uh, she's, she's very interested in the field of ecclesiastical embroidery, as you can see from some amazing work in the gallery. I'm sure you've all seen it. We don't, we, it's so wonderful, we don't know which side to show the front of. <laughs> or the, 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 show the, 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 the front or the back. Um, and um, she's really working a lot with uh, Celtic designs and has worked with Grown House Museum. She's very in influenced by George Bain's work and Pictish stones, which are all around in, in the landscape of, of uh, the Highlands and Eastern Scotland. And she's undertaken a, an amazing felting project with five groups, and she's going to tell us all about that just now. So welcome, Ruth. Thank you very much for inviting me here, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here and to meet all the people that some I met in Andover a few years ago, others I've just known on Facebook, and other people as well. But today I'm going to tell you about this project that I did through Grome House Museum. Now, Grome House Museum is a small museum on the Black Isle, which it's in Rosemarkey, the village of Rosemarkey and you can see it marked there on the map. And the Black Isle is that section there, which is not really an island, it's just a peninsula, but it's always known as the Black Isle, with various theories about why it's called that. So, as Mike said, worked with five different groups. Now, this was a kind of outreach program for Grome House Museum. They managed to get some lottery funding, and the idea was that they were going to introduce the people of the area to the work of George Bain, because Grome House Museum actually holds the George Bain collection, and as well as a very impressive collection of Pictish stones. So this is the inside of the museum, um, large cross slab, but there's also lots of fragments around from the area. That side's probably the more well-known side because it's rather less weathered. Lots of key patterns for Michael there, um, some of which I've worked on myself. Um, but anyway, there's some of George Bain's work that's on display. That's his drawing of the Nig Stone. I'm going to have to study that. I've got a commission that I need to use that one for. So, um, But really, most of this project came about because of this person, Wendy, Wendy Sanders, and the boundless enthusiasm that she had and her ability to coax money out of bodies like Heritage Lottery Fund and, and that sort of thing. And so, really, she came to me because I'd worked with her in the past on other projects, and so when she managed to find this money, she came straight to me to do it. And the idea was to make five large felt wall hangings. Now, there were some restrictions about how we actually did the, the wall hangings, what we were going to make. Some of them were just very simple, practical ones, like the roll of paper that I had that I could do a design on a single sheet was four feet wide. So four feet wide seemed like quite a good bet. Also, sheets of timber come in four by eight. And I had one that had been cut down into three pieces that could join together and fit on top of tre trestle tables, which meant that I could take it with me but still fit it in the car. So four by eight seemed like quite a good starting size. Felt when you make it always shrinks, so you allow for that, you're going to end up with something that's a metre by two metres. So we drafted out 
a kind of general schematic of what it would be like. And this is the first group here. You can see there the idea was that there would be not work panels in the spaces round the round the edges. As you see in lots of the illuminated manuscripts and on some of the Pictish stones, there are these sort of blocks of knotwork and key pattern around the side. We decided to stick with knotwork, it being slightly easier for people to get their heads around. So this was them studying the concept. Then they had to start the work of actually making the, the felt. So they're choosing their colours, and this is this is just um, fleece that's been washed, wool fleece that's been washed, combed, and dyed, and they're choosing two colours to work with to make a double layer of the fibre to then trace onto some special paper the knotwork designs. Now you'll see there that there's no overs and unders. That's really important at this stage. When you're working with textiles and you're doing this kind of um, layering of fabrics to get your designs, you do not want the overs and unders because it means you end up cutting where you don't want to cut. There's one bit where they've actually drawn the line in. Uh, I think I've got a pointer. there, where somebody's got a bit carried away with drawing their lines, but as a general rule, you don't want those lines. So the idea was that they laid these, this is special paper, they drawn on it with permanent markers, spirit markers, so that the, the ink wouldn't run into the wet felt, because that's wet felt that they've got there, and they're cutting out the shapes. The next stage is that we're making the background. So those were going to be the knots. Now we're making the background, and it's a question of laying down the fleece. And then decorating it up. So there were two layers of the white wool. And then the idea was to cover it up and make it maybe something that might be reminiscent of a Pictish stone or reminiscent of a bit of aged vellum. Um, but something that didn't look spanking brand new. Wetting it all down, rubbing it with soapy water, and then they could lay on all the pieces that they'd cut out. And we had quite a lot of time playing about um, deciding which bit would go where, and they were influenced by colour, and they were influenced by the designs they'd chosen. Some of these designs they'd drawn themselves, some of them I had given them a template to work from, because it really depended how much ability they had themselves. Um, the little bits of ribbon that are in the table, on the table in the middle here, weren't part of the design, they were actually just little bits that we'd cut to lay on top of the felt so that they could see where the overs and unders were going to go. And they could work them all out before they started cutting with scissors. You'll see there, they've got scissors in their hands. And what they're doing is they're cutting through, I don't know if you can see bits that they've cut. Now, one of the things about wool is that when you felt it, it shrinks. And it shrinks more the more you rub it. So if you've got two layers of colour, as you have here, there's a bright red and there's a dark red underneath. The bright red is closer to your hands, it's getting more rubbing, so it shrinks more. So where you've cut it, it actually pulls away and you see more of it. So that once those bits were all on and cut, they covered it up with bubble wrap and rubbed some more. And then we turned it over and rubbed on the back. And then we had to squeeze out all the water that was there. But then you're left with something like this. And you can see here all those bits where we'd cut to get our overs and unders. Now, I have to say, I could have done with some of Courtney's blue lights. 
um, <laughs> trying to get people to learn both a new medium for working in and a new design concept. And for them, it was a new concept because really, although they, these were all people living on the Black Isle within a stone's throw of Grome House Museum in Rosemarkey, they'd never been in. As so often happens, the locals don't go to the places that the tourists go to. The space in the middle was all going to be filled. Each group chose their own text and concept of what they wanted to do. And this particular image, this is from the group at Kilboke, and they, they were a church group. So we were working in the church hall, which is also a community center. And they decided to have the evangelist page from the Book of Kells and a biblical quote in it. So I don't know if you can... Oh, sorry. See, we're actually uh, working through stencils. I don't know if you can just make out there um, the... There's a sort of translucent plastic sheet in which I'd cut holes. And what they're doing is they're poking wool through with felting needles, technique called needle felting. And it just allows you to be quite precise. And the lines across were just pieces of ribbon that had been pinned in place while they worked so that they kept their text reasonably straight. I'm not sure how they did that in the illuminated manuscripts because it's not something I've made a study of, but we used ribbon. And you can see them all there. With there's, Some are working on the not work at the sides, some are working in, in the middle. It was partly who was interested in which bit and who, was, who had longest arms and longest back to reach over into the middle of the table. But that's the centre of that, the three sections. It was easier to photograph that way. Um, but it was still wet and a bit rough and ready and not all the knot work had been done. But you can see we're we're tramlining the, the edges of the knotwork, and this really picks out the overs and unders. So it took them a while to get their heads round. You can see on the back, the, what the needle does is it pushes the, pushes the fibres through the felt base that you're working on. And so that's the back of it. You can see quite clearly where they've, where they've poked the wool through. And this was one, this was from the village of Och, the group there. And Och was a, a very famous fishing village in the time of the herring. And this was a, a verse from the poem, The Silver Darlings. And you can perhaps see the fish there swimming in, a, in and out of the knotwork. Um, and then the the last group that I worked with was the Muir of Ord Art Society group. So they had lots of ideas. They were, they were more adventurous in their knot work um, in that they, they decided to do some zoomorphic work as well. Um, but they also wanted to include things that were related to the village. So it was renowned for its illicit whiskey stills of which there were something like 126 in the village at one point. <laughs> um, it was also a, a, there was a prisoner of war camp and there was military barracks and things like that. So they had the poppies for remembrance. And the, the reason the town came into existence was through the cattle droving. So they had the black cattle from there. So that was, and somebody had written a poem. Now, throughout all these groups that we had. Each, each group spent five days working on their felt over a period of a month. So like you'd have one day one week, one day the next, well two days the next week, another day the next week, and another day the last week. And I worked on them one in January, one in February, one in March. We had a break over Easter, did one in May and one in June. And what we found was that as we were working, lots of people in the locality would come in and observe what we were doing and sometimes try their hand and add in a little bit more. But here, we're, 
almost at the end of it, you can see them struggling. This is You're mostly seeing the back of it there, but it allows you to see quite clearly the effort that they've put into doing that needle felting all around the edges to emphasize the, the designs. And that's it upside down, and they're just putting more soapy water on to do the final wetting down, final rubbing, turning it over, and rubbing some more. This is really just soapy water and muscle power is what makes felt. Um, you can do it with, with things like washboards and what have you, but the invention of bubble wrap was a boon to people making felt. <laughs> and then you've got all this soapy water that you've got to squeeze in. So I'd, I'd got a big plastic box just for the, just for the purpose. And then the really hard work begins because it's all got to be rolled. And it's got to be rolled backwards and forwards to a count of about 200 each direction on each side. So that's eight times. So we did it as teamwork. And then, of course, you've got to do it along the, the length as well as the width. So a lot of effort. But at the end of that day, they had something to hang up. And of course, everybody wanted to photograph it. And then after all five were completed, we had a party for all the groups. Somebody had a lovely sort of open barn and we hung them all up in there. So that was the five wall hangings. And then they went on display in the Highland Council headquarters where they were well received. And after that, they went to the Celtic Connections, um, what do you call it? Celtic Connections event in Glasgow. Mostly a, cast, mostly a music festival, but they have artwork on display. So these were displayed there. And then this was the one that was made, the first one actually of the groups. This was made by the Grome House Museum volunteers and it's currently on display in, in the museum. And that's the end. So I'm very happy to take questions, but if Mike, you would prefer to leave it till later, I'm happy to do that. We do have a, a maybe five minutes. Well, uh, I'll tell you what, uh, I had a special request. Um, it's kind of one of many today, <laughs> um, to have a photograph of everybody taken outside the front, uh, maybe in about uh, 10 minutes. Uh, would everybody be happy to do that yeah, and before tea? Uh, so we've still got five minutes to right. have a few. Well, one of yeah. the things yeah. I should say, yeah. I forgot to mention as I was speaking there, I did bring with me a, a large format A3 book that would made that covered the, the progress of the things. So if, if anybody wants to read the step-by-step -step instructions, I forgot to bring it in from the car this morning, but my husband said he would go out and get it, and I think, magically, while we've been in here, it should have appeared in the exhibition room, so people can look there. But I'm happy to take any questions if people have, have any. Uh, Ed here, sitting in front. Oh, yep. Um, how did the people respond to doing this stuff? Did they enjoy it to any degree? I, they, yes, they did. I mean, th there were some people who just kind of threw their hands up in horror and said, oh, I can't cope with, that, with Celtic knot work. They were happy to do the felting, but they really just kind of had a mental block about doing the working out the interlace. There were others who said, why haven't I discovered this before? And I think we're definitely going to go on and try drawing designs and working in, with them in different ways. Um, in terms of the, the purpose of the project for, you know, actually bringing the work of the museum to a wider audience, it served its purpose because 
I mean, I showed you that last slide, the one that was up on display in Grome House Museum, because that was made by the Grome House volunteers. That was the first group. But the other ones were made, I mentioned one in the village hall, the, the community centre and church at Kilboke. That's on display in the church, so everybody that comes into the church sees it, and they ask questions about it, and they get inspired, and so it ser serves the purpose. Another two went into village halls, and the final one, the Muir of Ord, one went into the community hub in Muir of Ord, I think where they have a library as well. So people are seeing these. Yes, people were mostly enthused by learning about Celtic design, even though we kept it very simple, they could see the potential for going further with it. Thank you. Hi Ruth, um, Nicola Dixon here. Is Hi. this a technique that was, I mean, I'm aware that felting has been used in the past, but felting and Celtic knotwork and these sort of panels, well, is this the, the, historical? Well, the process is called the inlay method, and I'm not aware of other people using it for Celtic design, but it's very well, a very well established technique, this cutting out a half made piece of felt and laying it onto a background has been widely used for the likes of the Kyrgyzstan carpets and uh, Mongolian felts and things like that, you know, so the, the process is widely used. I'm not aware of other people having used it specifically to do Celtic design. I'm not saying they haven't, but I'm not aware of it. Thank you. Um, good morning. I just wanted to ask you, do you source your wool from a particular type of, you know, I, Do you have to be specific about the type of wool that you use? We, for this project, we used uh, merino wool. Two reasons for that. One is the ready availability of it in lots of different colours, so it's, it's, um, it's, it's easily sourced. The main reason, though, is that of all the different varieties of wool that are out there, Merino is the one that felts most easily. And it was important for each of these groups that they had an end product that didn't have holes, that would serve its purpose of being a decorative element in their village hall or wherever. So to ensure that they would actually get good results, we used merino wool to make it work. But you can felt with any kind of wool. Some just take a lot more muscle power. Some take an awful lot more preparation. And the, the second part of the question is going to be, how long will that piece last then? Is there like a if the moths don't get at it, it should last indefinitely if it's properly, properly displayed. Mm. I, I did advise all of them to put moth sashes behind the wall hanging and change them at least once a year. Whether they do that or not, I don't know. You know, you, you, you can't tell. But, I mean, wool fibre will last, will last indefinitely um, if it's properly cared for. Thank you. I think that's I think that's really true and for me I mean, most of us all kind of work away in our little corners and it's quite difficult to 
Uh, somebody was speaking yesterday. I'm trying to think who it was. Um, yeah, about... Uh, yeah, but no, there was somebody mentioned... Was it Ed? Somebody had asked Ed a question about whether he taught other people. And he was saying, no, he mostly sort of worked from his little, own little corner. And for me, that's very much the case. I work in my studio. I might not see anybody from one day to another. And to have the opportunity to go out and share both my love of the felt-making medium and the, the style of design with a whole new audience was just lovely. And the fact that they actually paid me to do it was better still. Um, and it's good to get out there. I mean, when you work like that, well, for a start, I could tackle a much bigger piece than I would physically be able to manage all on my own. I mean, you saw those slides of the doing the rolling. That would have been such hard work to have done on my own. I mean, I, I could do it. I have done big pieces for myself, but it's physically hard work. So getting other people to do the donkey work for you is a really good idea. Uh, Ruth, there's an, another chance to uh, talk to Ruth at the question session at the end of the morning. But we had, uh, you made very good time, Ruth, thank you. And uh, it was fantastic to hear about your, your community project there. Um, to need the speaker. Need the speaker. <laughs> um, and thank you to Michael for his great, um, what, a, what an amazing... Um, sort of summary of the development of, a, of, a, of an art form over 400 years. Um, so two great talks to start the, the, uh, the morning. Uh, if you would like to, we're going to have a, a group photo on the steps of the St. Patrick Centre. So that's right to the front door. And we're going to stand on the top of the steps and somebody's going to take a photograph. Um, that would be wonderful. Then there is uh, tea and coffee back in the gallery after that. And we're back here at 11.40. And 11.40, there's a special presentation as well. So do be back for that. Thanks. Thank you, Ruth.